the 2010s of college football will be most notably remembered for the dominance of Alabama and Clemson. The two programs combined to win six of the possible ten national championships during the decade, with at least one of them playing for the title every year from 2015 to 19, and a total of ten appearances in the sport's final contest by the time the calendar turned to the 2020s. While it's hard to argue the attention shouldn't go to teams that were so consistently at the highest level of the sport, I'm always drawn to the ones that perform consistently above their standard. With a wide range of variants for things like funding, facilities, and overall emphasis on the sport between colleges, this becomes a big aspect of analyzing success in college football. When looking at things from this perspective, there may be no better success story during the 2010s than the Stanford Cardinal. So naturally, it piqued my interest to dive into what allowed Stanford to erupt after years of dormancy, and then what fanned the flame at the turn of the decade. An academic-oriented institution nestled in Northern California, Stanford has had varied levels of success in football. They've had some highlights, appearing in their fair share of Rose Bowls, including the first ever Rose Bowl in 1902, a 49-0 loss to Michigan, and producing legendary quarterback John Elway, but the level of consistency began to fall off. This is what makes the previous decade of Stanford football so fascinating. It wasn't one or two double-digit win flashes in the pan, and there wasn't any revolutionary offensive or defensive scheme they started running that put them ahead of the curve for a few years. The Cardinal were regular Pac-12 contenders, winning the conference three times and at least a share of their division on two more occasions. In an era that was riddled with teams switching to spread and air raid style offensive attacks, Stanford stuck with a pro-style approach and relied on physicality both offensively and defensively to attain unprecedented success. This era for the program produced talents like Christian McCaffrey, Richard Sherman, Andrew Luck, Zach Ertz, Doug Baldwin, Griff Whalen, Levine Toilolo, Kobe Fleener, Ty Montgomery, Cameron Fleming, Blake Martinez, Dalton Schultz, Solomon Thomas, Justin Reed, Bobby O'Karake, and Austin Hooper. So how did a school that is more focused on being the Harvard of the West as opposed to a football powerhouse become so productive? Unfortunately, to tell the story correctly, it's important to start with the ugly, because everything glorious was built from nothingness. Perhaps perceived as a harsh analysis towards 2000 Stanford, but it takes a near literal form when starting our analysis in 2006 when Stanford went just 1-11. The lone triumph being a 20-3 victory at Washington that when the dust settled kept the Huskies from going to a bowl game which I throw in just to give the win a tad more meaning. The overall cataclysmic season opened the door for the first big move that changed the trajectory of the Stanford program for several years. The move I'm referring to, of course, is the hiring of Jim Harbaugh as the team's head coach. A former NFL quarterback and collegiate All-American at Michigan, Harbaugh was hired off the heels of turning the University of San Diego into regular contenders at the football championship subdivision level, going 29-6 in three seasons. There was an obvious immediate impact with Harbaugh, as the team improved to 4-8 in his first season at the helm. Momentum came somewhat gradually as the team improved to 5-7 the next season and jumped to a very respectable 8-5 in 2009. This period of building was highlighted by an upset of number 1 USC on the road as 40-point underdogs in Harbaugh's first season and a 51-42 shootout victory over eventual conference champion Oregon in 2009. A big indicator of the success to come was the gradual improvement of the offense, rising from 105th in the nation in 2007 to 54th in 2008 and 12th in 2009. They developed a strong between-the-tackle running game centered around halfback Toby Gerhardt who went for 1,136 yards on the ground in 2008 and 1,871 yards in 2009. A coaching staff featuring future head coaches and coordinators such as David Shaw, Willie Taggart, Tim Drevno, DJ Durkin, and Greg Roman helped the Cardinal develop a new identity. While recruiting is often the first metric people look at when explaining a program's emergence, this doesn't do much good in the case of Stanford. By taking the average rank of the four recruiting classes that make up each team, 
There is a slight downtick from 2006, the year before Harbaugh arrived, and 2007, his first season. The 2006 squad had an average class rank of 43.3, while the 2017 had an average rank of 49.5. In total, a 6.2 drop off an average, yet three more wins on the field. Even with a slight increase to 46.3 in 2008 and to 45.5 in 2009, Stanford never had a team with a higher average ranking than in 2006. Finding gradual improved success despite a perceived drop off in talent, not that we're using the most in-depth metric to measure, indicates an improved quality in the coaching staff, and the success of the names listed previously would suggest that this was the case. Not to downplay the importance of recruiting, as Stanford's 2009 class finished 21st and their 2010 class 25th in the nation. The gradual bump in talent and the hiring of Baltimore Ravens linebacker coach Vic Fangio as defensive coordinator prompted Stanford stock to skyrocket. Fangio has been responsible for the success of a number of different NFL defenses, including currently with the Miami Dolphins. His arrival correlated with a jump from 69th to 10th in total defense nationally. Complemented with the nation's number 9 total yardage offense, now anchored by Heisman runner-up Andrew Luck, the Cardinal went 12-1, finishing the year with a 40-12 win over Virginia Tech in the Orange Bowl and officially entering a new era of success. Stanford's lone loss on the season was to the national runner-up and their conference rival, the Oregon Ducks. In a way, the success of the season had its consequences, as Jim Harbaugh was hired to be the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers for 2011. He brought Fangio with him for the same role. Offensive coordinator David Shaw was promoted to head coach, and Jason Tarver was ironically hired from the 49ers as co-defensive coordinator along with Derek Mason, who had been the team's defensive backs coach, to replace Fangio. With Luck still at the helm, the Cardinal went 11-1 in the regular season for the second straight year. Once again, their lone loss in the regular season was to the Oregon Ducks. This would keep Stanford out of the inaugural Pac-12 championship game and ultimately the Rose Bowl. They appeared in their second straight BCS game, but lost to Oklahoma State in the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl 41-38. Beyond a singular additional loss to the previous campaign, the only hint of drop-off between the seasons was a decline from 10th to 30th nationally in total defense. The offense maintained their top 10 status, finishing 7th nationally in total yardage. Going into 2012, there was good and bad. The good would be that the program welcomed in the 7th ranked recruiting class nationally, the highest of the ones during the time we've examined so far. On the bad side though, they had to replace Andrew Luck who was taken first overall in the 2012 NFL Draft by the Indianapolis Colts. They also lost co-defensive coordinator Jason Tarver who left to become defensive coordinator for the NFL's Oakland Raiders. The former issue was resolved with Kevin Hogan being named the starting quarterback, and the latter with Mason being named sole defensive coordinator for the upcoming season. Losing the top pick in the NFL draft leaves plenty of reason to doubt, but Stanford responded with an arguably more successful overall season. Despite a 10-2 regular season, they earned a spot in their first Pac-12 title game, representing the North Division. They even overcame the ghost of Oregon, beating the number one ranked Ducks on the road 17-14. After overcoming UCLA 27-24 in the conference championship, they went on to beat Wisconsin 20-14 in their first Rose Bowl appearance since 1972. The Cardinal dropped to 72nd in total offense, but rose back near the top 10 in total defense, finishing 11th in the country. Having overcome two potentially major hindrances, Stanford remained a consistent contender in the Pac-12 for the next handful of years. They would repeat as conference champs in 2013 and make it three and four years after winning it in 2015. That year, the team's running back, Christian McCaffrey, would finish second in Heisman Trophy voting, losing out to Alabama's Derrick Henry. McCaffrey was the second Cardinal in this time period to finish second in the Heisman, with the other being the aforementioned Andrew Luck. The 2015 squad finished 12-2 and number 3 in the nation, after blowing out Iowa 45-16 in the granddaddy of them all. Stanford wouldn't make it back to the Rose Bowl after that year, but would make one more appearance in the conference championship in 2017, 
losing to Sam Darnold and USC 31-28. In 2018, the team remained competitive, finishing 9-4. In 2019, the scales started tipping the other way. There were signs of a potential rebound after a 4-2 2020 season, but back-to-back 3-9 campaigns in 21 and 22 signaled the end of the era as David Shaw resigned after the season finale. So what happened? What triggered such a sudden drop-off from conference contender to cellar dweller? The first thing to jump to is going to be the recruiting and talent, the same when examining the rise. Also like examining the rise, recruiting is going to be of little help to us. The Cardinal peaked with a four-year class average of 16.8 in 2017. The average dipped to as low as 30.8 in 2021, but went back up to 25.8 in 2022. Even at the 2021 mark, the average was nearly 15 points better than it was in 2009 when the program registered the first winning season of their run. This once again leads us to coaching. David Shaw was a mainstay, so at first glance coaching may not be what we jump to. However, there is a notable drop-off in the quality and depth of the staff. Pep Hamilton was named offensive coordinator going into the 2011 season. He would hold the position for two years before leaving to reunite with Luck in Indianapolis. His replacement starting in 2013 was Mike Bloomberg. He would hold the offensive coordinator role through the 2017 campaign when he would leave to take over as the head coach at Rice University. In 2011 and 2012 under Hamilton, the Cardinal finished 7th and 72nd in the nation in total offense respectively. In the five seasons under Bloomgren, Stanford finished 45th, 80th, 18th, 84th, and 38th. A falloff in production becomes noticeable when Tavita Pritchard takes over as offensive coordinator in 2018. In his first season, the offense finished 73rd before going 109th, 56th, 113th, and 109th in the following seasons. The peaks and valleys of the offense correlate highly with the team's success and therefore deserve some fashion of the blame for the falloff. Whether it was the play calling itself or just the staff being gradually gutted over time is hard to tell. The defense has to shoulder some of the load as well. In Derek Mason's two seasons as sole coordinator, Stanford finished 11th and 10th in national total defense. After his exit to be the head coach of Vanderbilt in 2014, he was replaced by Lance Anderson, who had been on the staff since Jim Harbaugh took over back in 2007 and would remain until Shaw's resignation in 2022. In Anderson's first season helming the defense, the unit finished second nationally in total yardage. While 2014 was a peak, the unit stayed steady under his direction the next four seasons, finishing 33rd, 18th, 35th, and 38th in total yards allowed. They fell to 80th in 2019 and were all the way down at 113th by 2022. A clear falloff on both sides of the ball despite steady recruiting rankings would indicate a decline in coaching and development. Blame can't be pointed at any one person, especially when a program had continuity at head coach for so long. The best general answer for why Stanford fell off would be a fall off in quality assistant coaching. When the quality of talent remains consistent, but the results do not, that's certainly the simplest thing to point to. Another explanation from a defensive point of view would be a lack of adapting schematically. This could explain why the unit suddenly declined under the direction of the same coordinator. In reality, there are several potential explanations. There are always answers, but they are often intricate and have many different potential rabbit holes. See what I did there? This probably explains why it catches my attention so much. While nowhere near a full explanation, this is an attempt to use contextual clues to give ourselves an idea. After all, that's a lot of what life really is, using information to make educated guesses. Stanford's run of success is the kind that often gets lost in the corners when looking back on history. The type of thing we love to shed light on here at Rabbit Hole Sports. Not quite a Heisman winner and not quite a national champion, so history forgets. But we don't. It's the type of run that brings in new fans and unites current ones. A great example of what makes sports so easy to fall in love with.